Thank you very much uh, to all of you. And uh, it's amazing to sit up, here, stand up here and hear, hear who you are and where you're from and realize that man alive. I just came from the Wadena First Nation, the lady that's just sitting here this last week. And one of the things that happened there was the young people coming together and saying, hey man, this belongs to us. And we don't come to the table empty handed. It was like an amazing thing that happened there. I want to begin first of all by thanking Gilbert White Duck for your amazing words. I don't think I could put it any better to, to, to talk about why we're here as you have done. Um, we need to hear that because we need that, that push. And we need to realize that notwithstanding what has happened to us, that it's our, our responsibility to do something about it. And I want to thank you very, very much for your for your wisdom that you shared with us because uh, it's clear from what you've said why we're here. I want to also thank the Dean for his welcome. Where did he go? Oh. <laughs> welcome us here. But my name is Satsa and I'm from the Wet'suwet'en Nation in North Central British Columbia. And I've been working at this governance stuff uh, pretty much all my life, just like a lot of you here. And I remember being a young kid, like about six years old one day, out in my uncle's back porch looking around the community and wondering, what is going on? There's something wrong with this picture. It was total social chaos, just like you were talking about Gilbert with brought on by colonization and the Indian Act and everything that it did to our people. And I remember standing there thinking to myself, doesn't anybody love me? You know, doesn't anybody care? And I got angry. And I, and I said, I'm going to do something about this. So I spent all my early years being an angry, angry young man. I was talking with Gilbert earlier on but how finally an elder sat me down and got me over it. And I realized that you can't accomplish good work by being angry. You've got to get past it, you've got to get over it, and you've got to look forward. As I said, I've been doing this a long time. Spent 24 years working on Delganook and Gestewe, going to the Supreme Court of Canada, coming out of there with the first legal recognition of our title and rights, our inherent right to self-government, recognition of our oral histories as valid as anybody else's history in the world, constitutional recognition, constitutional protection. And I hit the road running out there right across the country, Aboriginal title territories, treaty territories saying we won. <clears throat> and then watching successive cases come out of the Supreme Court, strengthening what we want to the point where there is no question we've got our inherent right to self-government recognized not only in law but in the Constitution and protected there. And start running faster. Come on, and I realized one day, holy man, there's nobody here. And I started to wonder what's going on here. And Professor John Burroughs did a research paper for us in 2008, 2009 in that area about getting out of the Indian Act using our own law. And in the writing of his paper, he realized that it was personal. So he looked into his own life and he realized that he was the sixth generation under the Indian Act and that his children were the seventh which means that the babies that are being born today are now the eighth generation under the Indian Act. 
and I realized that we have to turn back and deal with it. So there's no question in our history that we were on our land, governing ourselves, governing our territories, fulfilling our roles and responsibilities and obligation to the lands, the resources, and all living things. And there's no question about the fact of our inherent right, our history of our inherent right in Canada, from settlement to colonization to confederation to now, in effect the origin and content of the Indian Act. And we know the devastation that it's caused to our people. So when I think about what we're doing here and why we should be doing this, to me it's simple. It's about creating It's about the health and well-being of our people. It's about doing something so that we can be healthy once again, to strengthen ourselves, to, to do the work that we need to do to ensure our future. And then we know our history and legacy of resistance right across this country. Every one of our nations has that legacy. And we tried every which way in Canada to deal with this. We tried the political route, we tried negotiations, we tried direct ac action on the land blockading, and ultimately we were forced into the courts because we were denied at every turn. And we went into the courts, in effect a foreign court, and we used their law, and as former Justice Ian Benny says, we beat them at their own game. We created new law and we changed the Constitution to the point where as we sit here right now, without question, without doubt, we have the inherent right to self-government. And we don't need to negotiate with anybody what that might look like and how it might work. And what Gilbert said in his remarks, I think, is the guiding principle that we need to bring forward here, and that is we must not forget the people. So the way I look at this, this has to begin with the people, because what we're talking about is the right that belongs to the people. Our people have been left out long enough under the Indian Act, and one of the big challenges that we face is to be able to talk to one another once again with recognition and respect. To put aside the conflict that's been created by the Indian Act. To put aside that Indian Act culture out of our minds and our consciousness and fill it back up with our own. The principles and values that have guided us for multiple generations. But I've been working at this and trying to figure out a way to support nation rebuilding, to transform ourselves back to the place that the Creator and the Transformers created for us. So I called upon my friend Francis A. Bell, that I've known for a long time. We go back to the Royal Commission and then to the research project that we did. So her and I have taken a couple of cracks at this, trying to make something happen. And one day she set me up with a meeting with uh, Catherine McQuarrie in Vancouver. So I met with her there and she was explaining this project that she had and I was explaining this project I had and she said, well, I like yours better, let's do that one. <laughs> and so, so we got a team happening and at the time I was teaching and uh, Aaron Alexiak, who's sitting at the back there, was my was my TA, and so her and I started working and doing things together. And the next thing you know, we had the beginnings of a team to to take this on and create this transformational governance project to support First Nations and their nation rebuilding, based on the common vision of the people 
based on the priorities that the people set and starting where they want to start. So the idea of this multi-year research project is an applied research project to work with First Nations where they want to start. And I'll give you two quick examples. Someone wants to start with fisheries jurisdiction. The first question we have to answer is, well, do you have jurisdiction? Well, we know we do. And secondly, to help them research into their own language, <clears throat> their own oral history, their songs, and their art to find their own law. And then to be able to look at their own law and look at the modern day situation and realize that it stand up on its own, is it good enough as it is, or do we need to amend it? And to help do that and ultimately create a law making capacity with our learned scholars across the country, and we have many, many indigenous legal scholars, to help those communities write up their own laws. And then through partnerships with IPAC, the Institute for Public Administrators for Canada, and others, create the capacity to make it happen. And similarly, another group in, in British Columbia wants to start with jurisdiction around essential services, health, welfare, education, child protection, because they're all interrelated. So how do we go into their language and find their laws and then start to put it together based on the foundation of their principles and values? And so the idea of this project is bringing in First Nations that right across this country sharing our collective experience, helping each other, holding each other up, helping each other move forward, and doing the research in a way that it's transferable. So at the end of the day, everybody has the benefit of each other's experience, and everybody, everybody has the benefit of all of the research that's done. And what we're hoping to accomplish through this is to create a transitional inherent rights governance model that all other First Nations can use to transition out of the Indian Act into the realm of our own governance, our own authority, and our own jurisdiction, and to take back responsibility for ourselves once again, and ultimately ensure a better future for our children now and forever, forever on to the future. And as a part of this, one of the things that we realize is we've got to deal with the Indian Act. So what we've been doing there, we've got a couple of projects underway. One is mastering the Indian, Indian Act, working with Liltwet, and when we're done there, then tying Listigush into it so that we ensure that it's transferable and that it works and it makes sense. And at the same time, one of the things that we have to do is get and teach our people about the fact of colonization and the Indian Act. And when we do, most of them have never heard about it before. I go into communities, has anybody read the Indian Act? No. Does anybody know it? No. So we teach it. And our people are shocked when they learn that the stated purpose of the Indian Act was extermination. The advertised purpose became assimilation. And the effect that it had on our people, they realized for the first time wasn't their fault. And what happens is remarkable. People start getting up, especially elders, hugging each other, shaking hands and saying, I'm sorry, I didn't know this. Getting over that. But more importantly, making a con consensus conscious decision to change. And in that work, one of the things that we realized is our people are visual people. We need to see too. So I come up with the idea, by talk, we're talking with Dan McCarthy and others about the possibility of creating a systems map of the Indian Act. This is where this Indian Act came from. This is what it was designed to do. This is how it did it. 
This is what it did. This is, is the systemic effect of it. So when we're talking to our people and they talk about priorities being number one, the health and well-being of our people, we can show them directly that the reason why we're unhealthy like we are is directly because of the Indian Act. When we talk about education, and our people are talking about our own education, our own history, our own language, our own culture, our own traditions, our own homelands, they can see why a lot of that is gone. So the systemic effect becomes really, really critical to this. And when people can see it, it helps make a decision to change. Because if we don't get the decision to change from the people, then this is not going to happen. And I always like to say, our children deserve it. And future generations deserve it. There's no way that we should continue to accept less than the Canadian public has gotten used to. When we talk about essential services, there's no question that what comes to our people, Indians on the reserve, is on the order of 45% less than the public receives. And I look at that and I say there's no way that our children should have to accept less. And we have to stop that. We have to deal with that. So one of the things I look at here is we've got to equalize that. So fiscal relations becomes very, very critical to our work as well. There's no question that the Indian Act was not designed for us to be healthy and well. And there's no question that it won't work for us to be healthy and well. It's time that we make the move from that oppressive legislation into the realm of our own freedom, under our own systems, under our own governance. And if you look at it in terms of a history, if you can imagine a big, take a red paintbrush and I paint all around this room as a timeline to demonstrate the amount of time that we've been on our lands for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And you come to the time of settlement to now. It's just a little blip in our history. We can't let that little blip in our history destroy who we are as a people. And we need to take back our place, as Elder White Duck says, on our own territories and in Canada. We need to take back our place. And ultimately, it's about the health and well-being of our people. So I want to thank you all for coming here. We're going to have more in-depth presentations later on these projects. And I'm so thankful to you all. It makes me feel like uh, we're on the road, and when we get on the road together, no one's going to be able to stop us from doing the good work that we need to do for our people. And I want to just reiterate and underline that one point again that Gilbert shared with us. Don't forget the people. They've been forgotten for too long. So they're our responsibility. So thank you very, very much, and I look forward to sitting and talking with more with you over the next coming days. And I thank my colleague here, Chris Robertson. He's worked, we've worked together now for almost three decades. And uh, I'm thankful to him because his vision has never wavered. There have been lots of times where people have come to try to offer him all kinds of dollars to pull him away and uh, I have great admiration for him because he's never he's never taken it you know we're still here doing the same work and uh, I really appreciate that and as well my other colleagues Len Hartley over here 
and Brian Fitzpatrick. So thank you all. I look forward to a good couple of days.